If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode of Mind Pump. Mind Pump. Adam, Justin, and myself have some fun conversation for the first, I don't know, 30 minutes of our intro. We talk about nature versus nurture. Ooh, uh, who wins? Yeah, who wins? How important is each of them? Uh, we talk about the importance of hard work to realize your genetic potential. Hmm. You, you know, we know a lot of genetically gifted individuals, both physically and intellectually, but they're so lazy. Yeah, how that, hard are they working? That they're idiots. Uh, we talk about challenges with the educational system and what is not being taught. And then we talk about the cost benefit analysis of college. In some cases, it's totally worth the money. In other cases, it's not worth the money at all. Mm. Uh, also, uh, tomorrow, I want to remind everybody, um, if you're in the LA area, Adam and myself will be speaking at the LA Fit Expo uh, in the Healthy Living Pavilion at 1230 p.m. We're going to be talking about intuitive nutrition, answering questions. Holla! Team Handsome Squad. Taking pictures and kissing babies. Uh, we you also see mentioned- see my ass on crutches. That's right. That will be hard to find. That's right. <laughs> Just, I'll carry uh, him. I'm going to put him on my back in right. like a baby Bjorn, mm-hmm. uh, except he's bigger than me, so it'll be weird. Uh, we yeah, also mentioned weird. our sponsors in this episode. First, we mentioned Four Sigmatic. I talk about their chaga and its appetite suppressing- Don't rub it on your belly. Effects. Uh, you can rub it on your belly. won't do much for you there. Yeah, rub it on your belly. You have to take it internally. Yeah. If you go to foursigmatic.com forward slash mind pump, enter the code mind pump with no space, you will get a discount at checkout. We also mention our other favorite sponsor, Thrive Market. If you go to thrivemarket.com forward slash mind pump, this is what you'll get. One month free membership, $20 off your first three orders of $49 or more, and free shipping. Uh, And then we get into the questions. The first question was, which Insta-famous fitness celebrity do we think are actually people that embody the fitness lifestyle the best? And those that don't, what is our advice for them? How do they stay relevant and successful in this, what seems to be crowded world of fitness celebrities? The next question was, can you spot reduce? Or do you just lose fat all over, even if you target a certain part of the body? Lose them love. We also talk about how hormones affect fat storage and why Adam is looking like a pear. (laughs) He's so so huggable now. (laughs) You know what I mean? The the next question was, uh, this person thinks we have something against people standing on Swiss balls and performing lifts. No, we don't have a problem with that. We just think it looks ridiculous. I like Cirque de Soleil. Next question and final question was, uh, what is the most dangerous thing we have ever done in our entire lives? Oh, shit. Mm. Justin talks about all that unsafe sex he had in college. <laughs> I was a maniac. <laughs> Ravenous. Also, we are in January. This is the month everybody <laughs> decides they want to get fit. Well, here's what we're going to do for you. We got a promotion for the month of January. If you enroll in any of our bundles, any of our MAPS bundles, we have several of them. We have some that are dedicated towards people who want to look super fit but also perform like athletes. We have bundles for people who want to develop their butt and who have problems developing the butt. They have sleepy butt syndrome. We have bundles for people who want to correct muscle imbalances, prevent injury, and just move better. And then we have bundles that will cover you for the entire year, like our MAPS Super Bundle, which will give you workouts and exercise programs that will cover you for the entire year of 2018. If you enroll in any of those bundles, you're going to get a free t-shirt and our t-shirts are awesome they hell are yeah fucking yeah. awesome they're special they fit great we made them with yak fur they're blessed by tibetan mm, monks tri blend uh doug wore them went to bed took them off afterwards so now they carry his scent on them and believe me mm. it smells amazing wow a lot the of that golden is not, eagle a lot of that is not true but you are gonna get a free t-shirt that part is true if you want to get that promotion and get any of our bundles uh, the place to do it is mindpumpmedia.com. Dang. It's on the street. There's a there's a big difference. He's like a one-man yeah, band. He is. Yeah. He doesn't even need me. You're so good. <laughs> he doesn't even need me. Stop it, Sal. Just stop. No, he did, yeah, you know, no tell me more. Not that he doesn't need you. It's no. that. He, what, he, well, I always wanted so to be good. that guy with like the, you know, the spoons and... 
just really you know, like I have it? like my all my shit. Like, I try to get into that for a minute. Yeah, playing the spoons. No, you did it. Yeah, dude, really? you put them backwards like this, and your finger between them. The spoon man, you come actually, together with your hand. You actually put effort and time into learning how to well, play. Well, yeah, not a lot. I mean, I was I've never got really. I'm just I'm I'm musically retarded. I've told yeah. you guys that before. <laughs> like, I just I don't have the I don't have it, and which is weird because you think kids like me who were in church their whole lives and like my mom used to hit me upside the head if I wasn't singing. You know, oh. So well, you actually tried for like a yeah, long period. Then. Yeah, for a that long, might be it though. Wow. What did you say? You got hit in the head a lot. Right, right. Uh, it could be that, might be the reason. That or it could be me like slightly revolting. Like, okay, she didn't make me sing. I'm just going to be I'm gonna do awful. It, yeah, yeah, horribly. I just Amazing think- grace. <laughs> hey. How sweet the uh, sound. All right, so that's you pretending. Uh, hold on. That's you. That's, that's me being good. That's you pretending that's me to sound bringing, bad. That's me bringing the heat. Now I want you to say. <laughs> bringing the heat, Now man. I want you to try <clears throat> to be good. Let's no, that was me trying to be good. No, It doesn't get better than that. Come on, bro. I don't have it. So I think that's I think that's part of it i think my mom uh always were was making us sing, well there's so. a nature and, and nurture thing with with talent like there's definitely a, a genetic component and Absolutely. then there's something that you can train yeah and your genetic component i believe you gives have potential you, only uh, yeah it gives you a range certain directions right? like over here is the worst that you can get with your genetic potential oh, I, and over here's the best and yeah. your potential is just it, it's not that good right so you can reach your upper potential but yeah i could bad. get right like, if quickly I took, oh 100 it's I'd like bo- me playing golf or or you know right. uh, playing basketball right i think that i think this applies to everything we talk about this with building muscle and stuff like that like we all have like this and i believe this with intelligence too i yeah. believe some people are just fucked it's bro. true i believe their fucking ceiling it's is just epigenetic yes, gifts yeah just given. it doesn't matter dude <laughs> you're just you're this is your peak you know and yeah. i think everyone peaks at, at but i also think what's beautiful about life and how things all work out is people tend to if you if you lack some here there's everyone has their strengths right like it doesn't whether it be and you can look at this in so many different ways everything everything from the way you look to your intelligence to your 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 skeletal structure to your ability to play music like all these things but you know what's crazy about that is there's so many other factors that are also genetic or also nurture so what i mean or nature excuse me so what i mean by that is or nurture again what i mean by that is let's say you have your potential, let's say it's zero to 100. 100 being you're like the best in the world, zero being you're the worst in the world. And let's say we're looking at your ability to play basketball. Yeah. And let's say you're, you're up the top score that your genes will ever allow you to have with all cylinders firing, perfect training, perfect diet, perfect everything is 75. Let's say that's your upper limit. Hmm. Now, what also goes into that is what about your genetic propensity for hard work. Right, right. Mm. So not only Absolutely. Not only do you have a genetic propensity for talent, but then you have a genetic propensity for your ability to focus and work hard. And then there's a, there's so many other yeah. factors that well, go into there. And when you when you put that into perspective, I think that most people don't ever reach their genetic potential in any of those categories cuz very few people have that work ethic to actually push Push to those limits. Well, they're only drawn to the ones they immediately find as being, oh, well, this is easy for me. Well, and I, like, this I is the believe one that works. This is also why I love sports because I think sports are one of the greatest expressions of when genetic potential and hard work meet. When you look at the professional athlete, mm-hmm. you know, because it doesn't matter how much I played basketball, I'll never be as good as LeBron James. Just I don't have the genetic potential. Plus, he probably worked every bit as hard as I did, if not ten times more. Right, so I think that that I think that's why I love sports so much. Is when you look, especially nowadays, when you look at the athletes, it's so competitive that you just can't be like pretty good yeah. and get there. You had to have not. I totally only- feel it's like both now. Like right, if you look at professional athletes, yeah, like every now and then you'll see a guy that you know just worked his ass off to get there, and like he doesn't genetically look like he belongs, right? You know, but at the same time, like you know that motherfucker was in there just like busting his ass yeah. every single yeah. second, devoted his entire life to that one thing. Yep. Right. you yep. know what I mean. Like that's what it took. But it might, and my point is that we place a lot of value on that genetic potential because it becomes more evident at the extremes. However, you know how many people there are out in the world with like extreme genetic gifts that never oh, yeah. play in oh, the yeah. NBA, that never, you know, they're do never anything, exposed to it. That never do anything yeah. brilliant because they're also lazy fucks or maybe they have bad circumstances. Maybe they don't believe in themselves. Maybe like I've met mm-hmm. I'll tell you what. Uh, you know, I, I've managed, I don't know how many people I've managed in my life, you know, running businesses. 
And I've seen more extremely talented people who never succeeded yeah. than I did people who weren't talented who succeeded very well. I also, I've seen more. Dude. I also think this is what makes uh, incredible like teachers uh, and separates them is the ones that have this ability to see this in kids and to be able to, to encourage that and and pull that out of them at an early age because that's another thing too. You can yeah, you gen- help them realize it. Right, because you said it perfect, Justin. That sometimes these people have these genetic potential and they just weren't exposed to it. You didn't even know. Like You're I, right. I mean, I use the example all the time of the the swimming thing with me was I didn't even know. Like I didn't know that I was could be good at that. Like I just yeah. I didn't, had no idea. I didn't understand uh, the difference of and, and mechanics behind body types yeah. and like it, that it would actually the things that I got teased for actually could have been an advantage to me towards a sport. And I yeah, wish I well, had. there was a perfect example to this this guy that I played high school football with, and he didn't play with us until his senior year, really. And the whole time, like I played basketball with him, you know, he was he was six seven, and he was like long, lanky, but like really athletic. And I'm like, dude, you have to play football. Like, you would be an amazing wide receiver. And then my other friend finally convinced him to try out. And he tried out, and he made it. Dude, it was so easy for him. We would just throw it long to him, touchdown, like almost every time. Really? And then he got recruited to, like, UCLA, Cal Poly, and he just didn't have the work ethic. Oh, wow. No work ethic. He, all of a sudden, now he's in a pool of everybody else that are like, you know, have They're the also, same genetic gift, yeah, but yeah. they work their ass off right, at the right. same that time. Were, that were sleeping with a, so, a football next to their pillow when they were five. And, and, yeah. 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 And so there's always the, that, too. And here's the thing with when it comes to physical genetic gifts, they can, they can uh, display themselves in pretty specific ways. But when you talk about intelligence, intelligence is such a broad category that is so complex that... I, I mean, I firmly believe that most people have uh, a, a range of what they can achieve with their intellect that is much wider and broad than what someone could reach with athleticism. Do you see what I'm saying? Because I feel like it's so, it's so much more complex. I think, I think you know how many kids there are out what there. What are you saying? You're saying that what? When you when it comes to intellect. Oh, with intellect, you think yeah, it's, it's so much more. It's just different? broad. It's so broad uh, in the sense that there's so many factors that come into, you know, that can come into play with somebody's. Well, uh, I think I I think it's less of that and more that there's different types of intelligence, right? Like when you say intelligence, that really umbrellas a lot of different things. Like somebody can be. Well, what I mean by that is, I'll be more specific. When you see somebody, when you see a kid that is genetically gifted to be a bodybuilder or genetically gifted to be a football player or a baseball player or a basketball player. In many cases, it's pretty specific and, and pretty evident. It can be evident pretty easily. When it comes to intellect, many times... Oh, that's what you mean. Okay. Many times, it's so broad. It's, it's very deceiving. Like, it, you don't know. Like, dude, by looking at something. And they're well, only like, measuring it by, like, these very specific types of tests that feed to one type of well, intelligence. Well, that would... To me, it would go to real similar to the musical talent because you can't see musical talent on somebody. You can't see that. Like... Sports, you're right. That's very physical, right? You could look at somebody and say, "Oh, I bet he's." pretty Sometimes good. you could just look at someone and have a good guess. I'm saying, right? Just because you're right. tall doesn't right. mean you're good at basketball. Right. With, with sports, you there, there's. I think you can make an educated get. Most people that understand the body types. Well, dude, the, do you know how many? But not, musician, music, musicians, you wouldn't know that. You wouldn't know that. Like, not unless they tried. Yeah. Right. Right. And, and the thing about uh, intellect is, do you know how many kids there are out there that think that they're stupid? They literally think that they're dumb because. Someone Maybe they that. have either yeah. someone told them that, or look, I'll t- I'll use myself as an example, and I'm not by any means stretch of the means this brilliant, whatever. But I do love learning. I love reading. I would say that I'm more of an intellect than someone who's athletic. But I school to me was so unmemorable. It was such a, it was such a, it was a, it wasn't even, it wasn't a bad experience. It just was a nothing experience. So I had no idea mm-hmm. that I enjoyed a lot of these things because. What I connected with smarts was school, and because yeah. school to me was fucking boring and well, unmemorable. The environment matters. And dude, my girlfriend, my girlfriend, who's extremely intelligent, reads all, quite a bit. Has we have these great discussions? She hated school. She hated it to the point where she told mm-hmm. me she's like, when I was a kid, I thought I wasn't smart. I didn't think I was smart. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, did you pay attention? And she's like, no, I would check out. And I said, well, yeah, it was again. You weren't stimulated. You had no idea. You know how many kids there are out there like that, or how many kids who are have dyslexia or some other thing that may give them a challenge, and now they believe to themselves that they're just not smart. Yeah. And a lot of some of them turn into entrepreneurs and become successful and learn it later on. Some of them don't. 
Mm-hmm. You know, some of them don't. So shitty. Another- do you think? Do you think more often than not, it's something that happened to them in childhood that that sets them on a trajectory that's going to forever, like totally. kind of yeah. nurture. Totally, I agree. I, agree. I, I still to, to this day, I think if it wasn't for me, uh, being put in advanced English class by a, a teacher who had me, who saw something in me that I didn't see that would have forever been a disability of mine. Something that I just laugh at and I don't think is a big deal that I fuck up sentences and do things like that was the same way that she treated it with me was that you have this ability to express yourself in words better than any kids in this class. You should be in an advanced class. And although I have my shit all marked up in red because grammatically I was all over the place, my ability to take what's in my mind and put it on a piece of paper was advanced. And that uh, that stuck with me forever that I wasn't going to allow. Because I remember before that, I remember being beat up, getting marked down all the time. And feel like, am I stupid? Like, I just can't get this. Like, why doesn't it? Why doesn't this make sense to me? Why can't I remember where a comma is supposed to go or apostrophe is supposed to go? Why can't I put that all together? Mm-hmm. And she she made me feel, make me look at it like those are minor details. Like pe- most people can't get out of their mind and put it on paper. You're great at that. And so she pressed that. I forever kept that with me. And, and that's forever formed me who I am and not, made that something that's a major insecurity yeah, where other weird. people like i didn't have anybody kind of reaching out like that for me growing up but i had people doing the opposite like saying that like i like they, they all assumed i was just gonna go into like a trade school and construction and that was it you know and my brother was the academic and that was gonna be the case and that is the sole only reason i went to college you know if to i could prove them wrong yeah like literally that was it. That was my entire motivation. I hated school, yeah. dude. I hated it. But I just was like, I wanted to prove a point that I could do something that people believe I can't. Well, dude, think about it this way. Like, so I was listening to music the other day while I was working out and what's that rock song? And at the end of it, it's like, uh, this was a rock day for you. Yeah, yeah it was a rock day. It wasn't a, uh, good, it wasn't a chill good, day. Good, 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 what's good. that? What's that song at the end of it? Like, um, you know, no more books, dirty looks. And at the end of it, it's like, school's yeah, been Florida. blown to pieces. Out. Two okay, for summer. Yes, that one. Well, yeah. So, so oh, that's Alice Cooper. Was it Alice Cooper? Yeah. Okay, so there's actually there's been several songs, right, mm-hmm. where they sing about how shitty school is. Yeah, and I when don't you t- remember uh, excess. Yeah. I don't want to go to school today. I remember that yeah, one. Too. Yeah, there's a yeah. Bunch of them. We don't need no education. Okay. Right. Yeah, that's Pink Floyd. And you talk to kids, and it's accepted. It, it's it's actually uh, it not only is accepted, it's expected that a kid is going to say, "I don't like school. I hate school." And I was having this conversation the other day with Jessica where we were talking about this. You have all these kids who hate school to the point where they sing songs about it. It's like a thing <laughs> that we all expect. And what do parents tell their kids? It's just something you got to do, yeah, whatever. Do it. Okay. How shitty is that? I How know. fucking shitty is you gotta that? You got to go to prison. How shitty is that that, that kids view uh, right. school to the point where... It's kind of rare if a kid likes it, and most of them don't like it. Yeah. How shitty of a job are we doing, and how much potential is being wasted? Because school really is designed to uh, to kind of service the middle. Mm-hmm. So they're like they're good at kind of the middle average, and if you're anywhere on the ends, it's a shitty experience. If you're really smart, school's terrible. Kids hate it. They're fucking bored. They don't like it. Many of which become disenfranchised and never reach can never reach their full potential especially right. if they have an environment at home well especially if they don't have they don't have the the money to put them in like a private school and get extra education for them or push them in other directions They're or even know just- that they have the freedom or to learn what they want to they don't even know that they don't even know that that's a thing you know what i'm saying a lot of kids are like they don't even understand that cuz i i know i've known a lot of kids who don't necessarily do well in school, but you talk to them about a subject they're into, yeah, and they're fucking. Brilliant. Are there things well, that you guys both it. do for your kids that like to try and promote that, like finding what you love and, and encouraging them to be passionate about what it is and learning about it, even if it's not fucking math or you know social studies in Absolutely. school? Like, Absolutely. how do you guys do that? Definitely. So, if my kids show an interest in something, um, then uh, I definitely try to foster it and I mm. don't discourage it. So, like, if my kids are, if one of my kids is really into Legos or really into whatever. Um, then I'll try and foster that. I'll provide them with the exposure. You know, I'll take them places where they could see stuff that has to do with it. We'll talk about it. We'll watch videos together, that kind of stuff. The other thing too is I also uh, uh, like to tell my kids um, if they do something like they do a good job with school, I don't tell them how smart they are. I typically talk about how hard they've worked or I can see that you really enjoy the subject only because I I don't want them to identify with being smart or dumb. I want them to identify with 
the work, effort that they just put. working hard. Yeah, the effort that they put. Because forward. the reality is, life at sometimes right. you got an, you got an ace on. Oh, you're really smart. It's not you're really smart. It's all oh, man. You must have worked really hard for that. That's yeah. awesome. Or mm-hmm. or if I know he's not working really hard at it, because there are things that like my kid, my son, for example, math is just easy for him. So when he gets an A on math, I don't tell him I can tell you worked hard because I know he didn't. I'll tell him like I can tell you really like math. Like I can really see that you like math because I'm I want him to to I don't want him to, I don't want what I don't want is my kids to encounter a challenge later in life and then all of a sudden be challenged and it challenged their identity of being smart and then they just don't want to do it. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, oh wait, I thought I was smart. Now this is hard. Which Forget probably it. happens to a lot of people, dude. It does. Yeah. Absolutely. It does. It does. So I it's 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 kind of shitty, but um yeah, I mean we were talking a lot about this because one of my friends this has a two year old and they were talking about homeschooling. And um I used to have two friends that were really, really, really in the whole I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, but homeschooling has exploded mm-hmm. over the past decade or so. Like yeah. exploded. It used to be something that, you know, you know, super hyper religious people did or people with kids who are, you know, whatever, you know, the stereotype is weird <laughs> or whatever. Now you're getting a really intelligent people who are putting together their kids informa- their their kids education, you know, kind of piece by piece rather than sending them to one central area because they're seeing way better well, uh, benefits. This, this, let's be honest, and I know I'm going to offend some teachers out there, but I mean, it's because the schools are doing such a bad job at it. People are finally going like, fuck, I could do a better I know I'm working full time, but fuck, I could do a better job at teaching my kid what he needs to know to get him ready for life. And I bet you that's what's propelled yeah, that. Yeah, like the passion really is And the ability sometimes. Right, yeah. and it's easier now, right? I mean, back when I was homeschooled as a kid, that was like, you know, we had all these, you had to order all these books, and then once a, once a month we had to meet and do this. Like, now you can just... Everything could be downloaded to your computer or uploaded to an iPad, and you could. There's probably courses that you could teach them right through there. They just tutorials and go through. I bet they've really simplified it that a lot of people can. There's do. a lot of resources now right. that are out there, and it's crazy though because it's starting to kill the funding for public schools because public schools the way they get paid they'll get paid when kids show up, so they get X amount of dollars. So I know here in California, if I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong. It's I believe the average is around ten to twelve thousand dollars per school year per student. So if a kid goes to school here in California, that school, that public school, will receive in funding between I believe I'm I don't know if I'm a hundred percent correct, but I think it's ten to twelve thousand dollars per year. So if that kid doesn't go to that school, they lose that funding. And what's happening right now is you're getting a lot of parents who are taking their kids and either putting them in private schools or taking their kids and homeschooling. Both of which those markets are both exploding. You see them start to really, really take off, and I think it's because people are starting to see like, again, like if if your kids hate school, like really hate it, like there's some something, something's not right, you know. There, imagine if you were doing something. I mean, as adults, we wouldn't we wouldn't put up with that, really. Yeah. Would you Would you put up with that? Imagine if every day, well, I as an adult, for six uh, hours, you fucking so hated I, that. I don't know, dude. I mean, I think that part of that is what trains people to also get stuck in these True. careers where True. they, they yeah, stay yeah. for 20 exactly. years and they fucking hate their job. They're miserable, but well, they, that's they feel why, like they have to do it. Right. I kind of present both with that, like as far as, and I, and I know like you definitely want to foster what the passions are and like you can kind of see like where they gravitate towards that and you kind of give them tools in that direction. But at the same time, there's tasks that need to be done. There's, there's things that need to be accomplished and, you know, you have an assignment and there's a deadline to that assignment. And so, you know, I'm just reiterating the fact that real life is this, you know, and this is something that you're going to have to consider, you know, going through this process. There's going to be times where you don't like it is, it you is know, the doing these types of projects, assignment, working with certain people, but guess what? That's another learning uh, experience that you need to be exposed to, uh, especially, you know, the social element there, as far as like, all the different types of personalities and like I've already had a lot of conflict issues that we've had to deal with, you know, with my oldest, like with, with other kids and Oh really? So, so, so it, it, you know, it's, it's, that's a big myth though. There's a big myth about the social, so the whole socialization, by the way, you don't socialize kids, you socialize dogs, but the whole socialization myth that if they, if they, if they go to school, they're going to get better socialized and be a lot around a lot more kids. Here's where the schools make a big mistake is when kids go to school, they're put in a classroom with a bunch of kids the same age. Right. It, the, the what's It's far better if kids are around older kids, Hunter, younger kids. Who are whatever. more mature and, First of all, and can, yeah. Studies will show that bullying actually occurs at a much lower rate when you have that because older kids, believe it or not, start to 
kind of act like big brother, big sister to the younger kids. They start to mentor. You start to see this more often when it's all mixed up. That's also real life. Real life is not, I'm going to be with a bunch of people, yeah, you know, all kinda, my same age. The, same, yeah. the same age. Here's the other thing too, is when I look at uh, education in particular, uh, centralized planning education, like public schools, they're so fucking slow to move with the times. It's almost, it's almost comical. Like Mike, like I've seen Mike, I've seen kids are learning cursive. They're learning cursive in elementary school. Why the fuck are you spending any time <laughs> on <laughs> cursive? Now, if you might as well do calligraphy yeah, too while you're at it. Yeah. Now, if a child is showing, you know, my opinion is if a child is showing real interest and enjoyment in learning cursive, well, okay, then that, I can see that. Then learn something like you enjoy. Artistically. Yeah. But these kids are being forced to do something that they will not only never use, but it's a complete fucking waste of time, cursive. They're learning how to memorize. I, I understand learning math and stuff like that, but this whole memorization of, you know, you know, times tables and this, that, and the other. The reality is, you, how, like, do we need to real, like, do, do we need to learn how to track ourselves through the wilderness? I, I know that's a very important skill if you're lost in the wilderness, but the reality is in modern life, is any of us ever really going to honestly ever use that? Hmm. No, so that we don't learn that. Why are they teaching kids all this shit that in five or six or 10 years, what you're basically going to need to be good at is how to retrieve information because now yeah. all these other things do it for you, how to be creative and how to navigate this this kind of society. Right. Kids don't learn finance. They don't learn loans. They don't learn credit. They don't learn return on investment. I think that's a big mistake when they don't do that. Yeah. I mean, in fact, I remember I, I, a lot of I had a lot of resentment too with my family because they – didn't share that stuff from with me. Like I they didn't share, you know, debt and how important this was. I I mean I got the, the typical speech that I think every parent gives their seventeen year old before they get all the credit cards come in the mail, like, oh, you shouldn't get credit cards. Like that to me that was stupid advice. Like that was like the advi the to the extent of the advice from my parents was, Oh, you shouldn't don't get credit cards, don't get yourself in debt. Like that's it. Like, mm -hmm. well what about building credit? Like yeah. what about because if you don't yeah. have any credit like to, that and I and that ended up hurting me when I, I bought my house. Remember when I bought my house, I had impeccable credit. Problem was I only had one credit card that I've had going for like one year. And they looked at me and they're like, I, you need four credit lines in the bureau for you to get this house. And because of that, I had to, I had to take a higher interest rate on my, on my loan. Had I been responsible and just opened up a couple cards, used them, paid them off, used them, paid them off. I mean, the reality is you had no debt. You were paying everything off. Right. And it fucked you. Right. Yeah. Same thing. Right. Same thing for me. It was the exact same thing. No, but because I, I, I had no education on it. Nobody taught me. You know, right. I, the, the the extent of my education on things like credit was don't do it. It'll yeah. get you in well, trouble. Don't you guys, That's so silly. One thing that, you know, I remember expressing this to my wife some bit. We we're talking about like education and um, thinking about how, over over the decades, like you have sort of elders, you have like people with actual real wisdom, you know, that you can always go to. I feel like like we just don't retain wisdom uh, the same way anymore. We're reliant like way too much on uh, searching and navigating through these tools, of, uh, Googles and just, everybody else to tell us where this wisdom comes from. I, I think it's different. I think it's a different kind of wisdom. Like, mm -hmm. you, you know, you still need the wisdom to know how to navigate. You still have the wisdom to know how to utilize sure. all these things, combine them. I just think it's different. I mean, you know, nobody has the wisdom today of like, you know, a prehistoric man, you know, 10,000 years ago, but we still have a different kind of wisdom because if you took a prehistoric man and put him in today's life, you know, they wouldn't be able to navigate, right. you know, modern life. I, I, I gave this, so I had this talk with my son. I just worry when like all systems fail. You know what I mean? Where we're going to sure, be. Sure, sure. That's, that's the, the paranoia I sometimes have. Of course. Have, you of know? course. Uh, so, I, so, I mean, look, not that long ago, a man would need to know how to build something from scratch, a home from scratch. Today, people are specialized. Somebody knows how to build the foundation. Another person knows how to build the structure. And then this person knows how to do the sheetrock. And then this person does the the tile, this person's air conditioning, electricity. Mm -hmm. And so we have much more complex homes that are better, that are more efficient and you know, all that stuff. And that's just part of human intelligence is that what makes humans so powerful is not that we're, we have this super intelligent brain. It's that we build upon past intelligence. Mm -hmm. So, you know, today I don't have to learn you know, physics, I don't have to discover physics from the beginning till, till now. Right, right. I learn uh, what everybody's known and I try to build upon right. that. I had this talk recently with my son where we sat down and we were talking about college. because like adding to algorithms. Yeah, exactly. 
I was sitting down with my son and we were talking about um, college because right now we're looking at uh, in you know a couple of years he'll be going to high school, and so I started talking college with him and I and so I, I laid this out for him. I said, okay, I said I'm going to show you two scenarios and I want to show you, I want to explain to you what return on investment looks like, and what this means because what's being hammered into kids. It's, by the way, part of the reason why I think we're in this crazy uh, student loan bubble. One of the things that we've hammered into kids is that an education is so valuable that it doesn't fucking matter. Just get it. doesn't matter how much it right, costs. Right. Right? So I sat down with them and I said, okay, let's imagine you graduate high school and you're 18 years old. Now I'm going to split you into two. You know, Here you are, 18 years old, you graduate high school and you decide not to go to college. Here you're 18 and you decide to go to college. Let's start to add this up and make it and, and, and see what it looks like. Over here, you didn't go to college. However, you know what you want to do and you work towards building uh, or creating a lifestyle for yourself based on a passion you have. Let's say you want to become an electrician. So I showed him, this is how much, and I looked it up, this is how much you would earn uh, learning how to be an electrician with an apprenticeship. This is how many years it would take you to be full-time. This is the average pay. Now, you know, over the course of 10 years, by the end of 10 years, you might be making about this much. Now let's go over here. Let's say you go to college and you get a PhD in art history. And I use that uh, an, uh, that example because it's obvious. Art history, PhD. It's going to take you 12 years. The amount of debt that you're going to accumulate during that period of time is probably going to be you know, $100,000 or more. Um, now you're you know, 28 years old or whatever, $100,000 in debt. The average art history major makes this much. And I'm showing him. And I'm showing him because I want him. And then I used other examples. I said, doctor, lawyer, you know, uh, a, a, a computer engineer. And I used all these different examples. I said, can you see now with the current cost of an education, how in some cases it's very worth it. And in other cases, it's not worth it at all. In fact, it actually costs you way more money than what you get out of it. Right. And it's really started to make sense to him. And he says, well, what if I really like art history? And I said, you could still learn it you would just not invest $100,000 in debt in learning it. You would use all the free resources that we have today to be able to learn those things. And I think nobody has this conversation with their kids, and I think it's terrible. Yeah. Because you always because student loans are easy to get. They're really fucking easy to get. And there's yeah, all they, these- They make them that way. They make yeah. them that way because- uh, They're you know, impossible to get out of. Well, politicians <laughs> say, we want to help education, so we're going to give all these subsidies and make it and tell the banks they have to give these loans out and tell the it's banks if they default. You can't, you can't even claim bankruptcy, can you? No. And, and, and what ends up happening as a result of it is you get all this easy money, all these people who think education means everything regardless of what they learn and what they get out of it. And now you have all this free money, all these universities trying to collect this money. And it's no wonder the, the cost of education has exploded yeah. to ridiculous rates. But this is where I think a lot of the problems are. And to be honest with you, I think it's all going to change. No, it's going to be disrupted. Totally. Yeah. I don't yeah. think we have an option. It, it, it's no, about it's, time. It's just like, wait. It's I a get, dinosaur formula that everybody's Apple, Amazon, and Google are on their way with all that stuff. I truly believe that. I Dude. mean, it just makes sense as a company, too, that if you... I mean, I don't know how many... I don't know if Doug can Google this, how many total employees work for a company like Amazon or Google or Facebook <laughs> or any of those. But when you start getting up in the tens of thousands of employees... It's worth your time to probably build a university. It's, like its own little country that is solely based around your company, where it's doing oh. currently, what it's doing in the future, and educating the young minds on how they can be a valuable asset to that. And I think companies will invest in it, and that's where fucking it's going to shake things up big Dude, time. Dude, not only that, because it's such a competitive market when you try and work in tech. It's so competitive. Why they make so much money? Because it's so competitive, and there's not enough talent. Uh, to 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 Can go you imagine the companies. brainwashing you, and propaganda is you know, I'm going through you know like Amazon you dude do you know how this is okay so check this out my my niece is a recruiter for Facebook she was a recruiter for Google before she's moving out she's taking off to New York next month to to live out there and help start up another one of their recruiting headquarters and so I'm kind of asking her details of how big those normally are they're normally between fifty to one hundred and fifty employees in these hubs and they're in all the major cities right New York Seattle L A San Jose whatever and so what they what they do is their entire job is to find these other people on from Amazon, Google, and basically poach all these yeah, people yeah. and they're competing with them and it, it's a struggle for them, but they have a whole, 
they have a whole building dedicated just to finding these people that have this level of uh, education and experience in this arena and field. If they're spending that much money already on things like that, what makes you think they're not going to in about the future invest in- Think about it this way. If you're Google or Amazon yeah. or Netflix or whoever and you're exploding, you go – and by the way, it's, it's not hard to see in high schools who's already gifted and who wants to do this kind of stuff. You can go to robotics tournaments. You could go to engineering classes. You could talk to teachers. What if they went to these kids and said, hey, uh, I know you just graduated high school and you want to go to whatever university. Here's what we want to do. We're going to pay you. And for the next two years, not only are you going to get paid, but we're going to teach you the following skills and give you these certifications. And then you're going to have an opportunity to work for us. How many kids do you think would fucking jump on that? Oh, yeah. Especially low income kids, especially kids who show uh, a talent for this kind of stuff who can't afford to go to college, who might need to make money right now, right. it would be so smart on everybody. And I guarantee you that's ha- that's going to happen. Oh, yeah. I guarantee you that's going to happen. I agree. I guarantee you. And, and, and the, the universities are just, they're fucking ruining it for themselves. They really are. They're gonna, they have no idea how bad mm. they're going to take a hit in the next 20 years. Or if they do, they're just, they're like Blockbuster. They're like Blockbuster when... You know, Netflix started coming out. They're totally <laughs> blind and pretending like they're going to be around forever. Yeah. But I'm sorry, man. In 2018, when you're gonna, when I'm taking your class, that's costing me a shit ton of money, and on top of it, I have to buy a book <laughs> yeah, right. that's three hundred dollars. This is bullshit. Right. You know, it's a fucking racket. Right. Right. Yeah. Oh, what do you got? What do you got? Something we were opening up a box for four? Yeah, we got Thrive Market Box. Oh, First one for 2018. Just to bring on the goodies. Have we, has anybody looked into getting something for all this Thrive stuff that we're starting to accumulate? Like a pantry thing? Well, we oh, have a closet. So- nope. nope. We have a closet. <laughs> but we're, but we we're, should. We're using <laughs> most of it, though. Yeah. yeah. I'll yeah. eat the fuck out of it. I've been. Okay, so this is a little bit different box today. We travel a lot. And I end up cooking sometimes. Mm-hmm. So this is really for me. <laughs> and for you. This is Actually, the self you know For you and for yeah. me. Yeah. So here's the thing about cooking healthy food. You know, it's all about flavor, right? So it makes something taste good. Yeah. So I have some ideas here that we're going to have when we travel. It starts with uh, some red boat fish sauce. Oh, okay. What is that, dude? I've never used fish sauce. Pass that over here. Red boat. Is that the stuff that they... Um, that you get like at a Vietnamese restaurant where they dip like egg yeah, rolls and stuff in. Exactly. So it's like that's, salty. It's salty. It's used in Vietnamese cooking. It's used in Thai cooking. Okay, that's what I thought. Southeast okay. Asian cooking. I know hey, baby, give me some of that fish sauce. Mm, <clears throat> that fish sauce. Sounds gross. So I love Asian flavors, personally. <laughs> so we, know you lo- you, we know you do, Doug. <laughs> in many ways. You yes. don't say. Uh, yeah. So here's some toasted He's sesame oil. Toasted sesame Eden oil. Selected. Boy, they have some really unique stuff here, man. This, this is like stuff that you normally have to go to like a specialty wow. store to go find. Yeah, you have to go to the Asian market oftentimes. Right, right. Thrive M- carries on this. Most regular huh? supermarkets do have a Asian aisle, but you know this is less expensive. Here's some Thai kitchen red curry paste. Oh, that's spicy. Did you? So, are, uh, because Thrive Market has these products, they're all non-GMO and probably better off. Better, right? Yeah, I, it looks like they've sourced really good products here. Okay. Now, this one's called Mother-in-Law's Gochujang. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but it's a fermented <laughs> chili paste. It's a Korean uh, paste. It's excellent. Hey, hey, Justin, I saw your mother-in-law's Gochujang yesterday. <laughs> don't you talk about my Anyway, mom. I use this a lot when I cook. I love the, the I'm, ex- I'm excited for what you're going to whip up. Or, you know what I feel like? This is You're putting together Gochujang. the recipe for those Brussels sprouts that I really liked over in L.A., Oh was, yeah, wasn't that all this? Oh th- yeah, yeah. The yeah. ones, the ones that we had at that one place. What was it called? Oh, those were. Oh, oh that's right. I was, wanted to recreate those. Guess what we're gonna eat when oh, we go to the man. expo? Yeah, no, right. I got some peanut Screw butter. You guys, this is Thrive Market brand. Bring me some back. Oh, good. It's great for peanut sauce. Oh, peanut butter. Oh, Very nice. Yeah. So you can see where I'm going with this. I'm going like chicken saute with that. Like, yeah, that I Thai see that. Uh, peaten butter. Dude, sauce. I can't do chicken saute so anymore. What? What? I got sick. What the hell's wrong with you? Native forest, we got some coconut milk. Oh, that's the one that I used to make my weight gainer shakes with. Yeah. That's straight up. That exact brand? Yep. And that's a ton of medium chain triglycerides. That's organic. Nice. We also got Thai Kitchen organic coconut milk. I'm going to tr- compare the two. Mm-hmm. Got a few cans of that. All right. Dang, Doug went off. Yeah, you did, dude. He, he wants to cook. He's ready. And yeah. then I noticed that Thrive Market, this is off topic a little bit, they have their own jerky brand. 
So oh, I thought, let's I'll give it a try. Dude, uh, you yeah, might want to keep, why don't you keep those in the box there? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Adam and Jesse started eating it during the I'm hungry right Whatever, now, I didn't even get any of the last one. Dude, you guys fucking scarfed all the jerky down. I don't feel bad at all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The jerky and the really nuts know. don't last but a day or two around you guys. Watch out, there's peanuts right there. I, I jerky my nuts That's, all day. Yeah, but how much is left of those things? Justin was fucking That's a half drinking the, them, dude. Yeah, the whole half a bag. He opened the bag and he was just pouring them pouring them down his throat, dude. See, this is why we keep- You open the gullet. This is why we keep the food from Adam. That's why I want to put it in the pantry, dude. He's about, he's Unhinge about to, and poor. He's about to create a bunch of mouth noises on the podcast. You know, people love mouth <laughs> noises. <laughs> and they won't here. even know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, he no, moved no, the mic away. Not at all. This quaz brought to you by Organifi. For those days you fall short on getting your organic veggies or whole food nutrition, Organifi fills the gap with laboratory tested certified organic superfoods to help give your health and performance the added edge. Try Organifi totally risk free for 60 days by going to Organifi.com. That's O R G A N I F I.com. And use the coupon code MINDPUMP for 20% off at checkout. All right, first up is from Diary of a Fit Guy. Hey, it's our boy. Ah, oh, yeah. Which Insta-famous fitness celebrity do you think actually embodies the fitness lifestyle the best? And what would you advise him to do to stay relevant and successful? Wow. I have no idea. That's a really hard question. That's su- I, super I, tough. Like who's doing it well? Well, I will say this. I will say, um, you know, part of what we saw um, as far as our, the blue waters, right, in this in this ar- arena was, you got to explain Blue Waters first. So so Blue Waters just means that, you know, everybody in business, uh, when something is popping, like like podcasting is, is getting more popular, right? So it's becoming shark infested, right? Lots of uh, lots of fish, a lot of people, and they're fighting over similar type of topics. Like there's, there's probably a hundred keto podcasts now. There's probably a hundred, you know, muscle building type podcasts or more like, so it's becoming shark infested. So, so that's becoming red. Right. It's becoming red waters, bloody waters. So finding your blue water water is, you know, finding an area that is untapped or that you don't have a ton of sharks in already. So I think when we first came into this this space, something that we all agreed on that was needed was some way of entertaining people with education together because there was a huge division at mm-hmm. when we came in, we felt, we felt like we could be wrong, but if this well, was what like we, academia and bros, right? Exactly. Was it was it. one or the other. It was either you had this entertaining side, the sex appeal side and just funny, comical with not a lot of content to back it up or a lot of really good, solid information, or you have podcasters, uh, w- which are a lot of our friends that are very intelligent, that, you know, put out incredible information, but not everybody wants to tune into a podcast and just feel like they're going to school every single time they tune in. Some people want to, you know, casually listen. And I feel like that is a, was, was a major formula for our success. And I also think that it will be continue to be a formula for future success for us. And I think you'll see more and more people model that. Now, who do I think is, killing it in the insta famous world right now Well, because the way i look at it is somebody who's crushed and i'm we say insta famous so i'm going to use instagram as an example people who are when i say crushing it in instagram i mean half a million to a million followers or more like because there's a lot of good people with a hundred thousand followers but i'm but the people are really killing it half a million to a million and so far i've seen Nobody, and now that doesn't mean I haven't seen everybody, right? But from what I've seen, I've seen nobody who I think is really exemplifying the right message with fitness and health. No, I disagree. I think that, well, how, about, how about someone like Ben Pikulski? I think Ben Pikulski- is he, is he that big? Fuck yeah. Half a, no, no, no. Bro, is he a half a million followers? Oh, I don't know if he's a half a million. That's what I mean. I mean, I'm talking well, about the people with- he, with like a, you know, a he's ton. he's considered in the in the fitness space. He's he's famous enough, bro. The guy's a pro bodybuilder. He's been on the Olympia yeah, stage. He's I'm, got a huge business. But like, the point I was going to make is like that. I'm talking about the big Instagram pages, half a million, million, two million, three million followers. What they tend to do really well is Instagram. They well, do Instagram no, yeah, really, but, really yeah, well. Yeah, but listen to the question. The question's asking who do we who do we think that's Insta famous that we think is doing a good job or putting out the right message, not who we don't think is putting. Well, out what the right what do we mean by Insta famous? He he kind of made his name before uh, social yeah, media. I think, right? I think yeah. it's just his way of saying famous. Like you know, it's just a way of saying famous. Somebody who's right? up there. Yeah, yeah, right. And Ben Pikulski would be considered if you get over a hundred thousand followers, you're Insta famous. The average Jane or Joe doesn't build more than a couple thousand people following them, even mm-hmm. if you're really popular, right? Mm-hmm. So anything, I think anything over 10,000 could be considered that, right? So 
who do we think is doing that really well in our space? I think Ben has a really good message, and I think that uh, a lot of what he talks about resonates with me. Now, I think if he's going to continue to do well and continue to explode, I think where he's different from us is the entertaining side. I think there, he's he has a lot less focus on that, and I think that's okay. I think he can have a very successful business, and I think that will uh, he'll continue to thrive, no doubt. I think we have a lot of our ambition is to break into break on break into the larger market which is outside of fitness like we don't want to just talk to people that only care about fitness and want fitness facts every single day we want to actually help the average Jane or Joe somebody who you know enjoys the entertainment factor of the business and then oh by the way these smart guys give me bits of mm-hmm. information that we're going to help me live a healthier life yeah. it, you know what's unfortunate is when i think of like mega like fitness celebrities like the people that the average Jane or Joe would know because the average Jane or Joe would have no idea who Ben Pakulski is or Mind Pump or any of these other people. The ones that everybody knows of, like the real uh, big famous people, I, I don't know. Can you guys think of any of them that are really putting out good stuff? Because yeah. I don't, I it's can't really tough. think of any. Like, right? I'm really racking my brain right now to kind of come up with some examples. But when you say insta famous, the the immediate like thing I think of are. Like the only people that are like super well known either are um, known by their super intense, like crazy uh, types of exercises that they display constantly, or they look insanely good, or they are showing a lot of skin, or, you know, like, uh, I, I don't know, I guess like. I mean, Amanda Bucci on some level, she's like pretty famous mm-hmm. on that level and like is kind of redirecting her message, you know, in the right direction, I think, mm-hmm. I guess would be an example for me. But, you know, anybody sort of on that level, uh, as far as like the new wave, right? The new wave of these people are becoming more popular amongst like social media. Uh, it's tough. Like, that's, Yeah, what we need is we need somebody or people who are in fitness. Like Lewis Howes. I don't who even have, think he counts as, uh, you know. Yeah, we need fitness. people who have a really good message who go big, big, mainstream, because the mainstream message with fitness is still terrible. It really is. It's still really, really bad when you get up to that level. It's yeah, when you still get up the to the, like the Jillian Michaels of of you right. know, Yeah, of although Jillian Michaels recently, like if you look at some of the stuff she talks She's about- She's been changing her tune a bit. She has. She, she, she really has. See, yeah. But uh, you're still not getting a great, uh, a great message. Now, whose fault is that? I mean, I blame the consumer. Yeah. At the end of the day, the consumer- they don't know what they don't know, so they just like you know the sweat. They like the burn. They like the high intensity, the fun. They like the sexy, and so that's what they give their money to, and that's what continues to grow and become bigger. And people with really good information who are saying the right things, they don't sell it as well. They just typically yeah. don't sell it. That's well, the problem. Even even ourselves, I think we we struggle with this. I mean, we're getting constantly hounded by our marketing team that. You know, we need to simplify, simplify. Even more. after we've simplified. Right. Even after yeah. we've tried to simplify things as much as possible. And we're like, well, we don't want to dumb it down or we don't want to make it to where it's, it doesn't make, or it's so simple that it, you lose the science behind it. Right. Yeah. But so that's a, that's even a challenge for us is like, how do we, how do we continue to provide great information and, and still break out of just the fitness, you know, little pond and get into the, to get into the masses uh, without uh, devaluing our message, right? By oversimplifying it, so that's definitely uh, a challenge. I think those that are that are like you know insta famous or you know famous on on social media right now. I think if it was if it's based off of things like looks and cool videos that you do and things like that, I think it's short lived. I think they won't be around for yeah. a five year five years from now. And you know, I'm and I'm talking about the like It the, works with the current yeah, format. The Paige Hathaways, the Devin Physiques, the those type of people. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that they're if they don't if they don't learn or ed- continue to educate themselves in the field that they're making most of their money because I'm not saying that those people can't go be successful like 100 percent those people could pivot and end up doing some multi level marketing thing, which I think Devin Physique is doing now I do some MLL thing and make a fuck ton of money but if you're going to be in the fitness space and you're insta famous right now and you got there off of booty pics or off of fucking cool videos or look at me I can do this funny cool shit I think that you will come you'll become a slave to that same thing and you'll have to continue to provide that forever and i think most people that wears on 
And I think we saw an example of that when we were mm-hmm. hanging out with Bradley down there for the weekend. You could tell that how much that is wearing on him that he is – you could tell he's that, much more yeah. than you know his popular like, videos. Right. Expect all that, all those types of like uh, gimmick stuff that you know he kind of like has to like do these crazy feats uh, to to sort of give it to them. They want that entertainment. Yeah, and I think there's, I think there's, it's like a double edged sword when some of these people go viral, right, or get get famous really fast because something that was good for us, it took a really long time to really get a lot of traction from Mind Pump, and we were very clear on our message and our vision. And I think that's helped us. The fact that we didn't grow fast. I think if we explode, if we put some video out already and it just exploded right away, then maybe you're we were tempted would, to keep doing the right. Same thing. You're, yeah. you're tempted to keep like, doing well, that worked. Right. It, oh, let's <laughs> yeah. just keep doing it's that. It's still working. Right. Where we had to rely on, okay, you know, getting better as podcasters, getting better interviewer, getting better interviewees, you know, doing things like that, that has actually just continued to build value in the show. So, you know who I think is starting to, who kind of does a good job of bringing, like good fitness information forward. Now I, I don't I don't listen to Joe Rogan religiously. I respect the guy. I think he's a great interviewer. Mm-hmm. But I've seen you know every once in a while I listen to his episodes, and he's done a decent job bringing unknown people right. on his show. He's gotten uh, like Rhonda Patrick more popular. Chris Kresser was on yeah. was on his show too. And, That's a great example. I think Joe know, Rogan's a good example. Yeah, he seems to be you know kind of bringing these people on who are talking about health and wellness and fitness differently than the old mainstream, yeah. you know, message. I think, I think that's a great example. I think, jo- I think, and I mean, he's, he's going, the, I mean, fuck, he's the Oprah of fucking podcasting. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like you're talking and about, he's going, he has man. a good knowledge base already, Dude. but yeah, you're right. He does seek out like He's a very intelligent, that's, very intelligent. Bro, yeah. he's going kind of mainstream. I don't know what I was watching the other day and it might've been, it was the movie Bright. It was oh, there Netflix. you go. Yeah, it was just uh, bright. It bro. was. Are you kidding me? Netflix just had. I mean, that they were showing. So, where is it at? Where is it at now? It was like at seventeen million or ten million, twelve million. Where is it at? Views already that have watched that. Now see him on there. Like, and they put him in. Oh, dude. He's, yeah, because he they were they were watching his podcast on their computer or whatever. So mm-hmm. Joe Rogan was in this kind of mainstream ish movie or whatever, and uh, he's going kind of mainstream podcasting. Going, so it's a good thing. And, you know, I like Rogan's message for the most part. He talks about all kinds of different things, but he's bringing some of these people to lie. I really think what it's going to take is this, it, to find the right combination of entertainment, mass appeal, and good information and communication ability is, that's like finding a unicorn. Yeah. I think what it's going to take is the people who have the ability to uh, have that appeal and to communicate well need to be the ones to introduce these super smart people. Rogan's kind of doing that. Yeah. We hope to do that right. as well. And I, I, I see that being more... I think you're going to see a lot of things shake up and change over the next five to ten years with... like Think about like the, the, the booty pics and the cool imagery or the people that Photoshop to get them to look for their transformation pictures. Like A lot of people got a lot of traction off of gimmicks and bullshit like that that... Right now, it's it's it, Instagram was so new, and these fucking badass iPhones and all this the abilities that we have with Photoshop, all these things are, are relatively new technology, right? So I think that as that kind of gets old, it's like it's, oh, I've I've seen that already. I've already, I've seen a thousand ass shots. I've seen a thousand guys do goofy things on Instagram. Like it, it as it starts to not appeal to people, and I think we're seeing it already. I think it's already becoming. I agree. Less cool. I think the hype. Yeah. Was was really cool when it first hit, and some people were smart, attached themselves to that, exploded, and are, are in, in a great place right now. But to maintain that, they will have to evolve. You will always you have to continue to reinvent in business. You always have to be reinventing yourself. If you're not growing, you're dying. It's one or the other. There's no cruising. You are fucking either the business is either dying or it's growing. Well, fake uh, is starting to become not cool, and real is starting to become cool. So like when we talk to our marketing team, right? And they're like, hey, when you do a video, just hold, do it with your iPhone because it gives that, that feeling of realism. Right. <laughs> Three years ago, four years ago, never, they would have never said that it was a professional camera, yeah. clean imagery, you know, good editing. Thousands of dollars. Yeah. And, to devote. and now people want that realism. You look at major advertising campaigns like Dove where they're showing, you know, quote unquote, real women or real people. Or you see these fitness celebrities now, or start. How popular is the picture now, 
where you have the girl standing all posed, and then she has a picture right next to it of her with her stomach hanging out, or she's sitting down and showing her fa- to show how real she Bro, is. Bro, I don't know anybody else that was doing that before I did that on, a, on my fucking Instagram. <laughs> I swear to God, Started dude. Started the craze. That was three years ago, over three years ago now, when I used to do the This Is Me first thing in the morning no, this is also too why when a lot of people meet me, they're like, oh shit, you're bigger than what I expected. And I was like, well, that's because all the photos that you see of me when I show you before and afters, it's first thing in the morning, flat as fuck, no carbs in me, no pump in me, standing to show you the difference of my progress, not 600 grams of carbs in me, a gallon of water and a pump. I'm a different human when I have 600 grams of carbs and a mil- I'm literally like a 15 pounds bigger and look probably 30 pounds bigger and with you're that. showing people the difference. Right, and I would show people. I'd show people even the difference of watch what happens. I would show that. i show watch what I, how much I can manipulate the way I look on Instagram from the morning till the night based off of food and a pump. And I would show people that. I've seen so many people do that af- after the fact. It's becoming a thing now. Oh, I, yeah. think, I think realism is starting to become cool, mm-hmm. which I think is... A good thing, um, but I'm also a little bit weary of it because it, with anything, they'll take something and then they'll turn it into, you know, it, it'll be super produced to look real. Right, you right. know what I'm saying? <laughs> of course. Like, oh, no, no, that looks too good. Let's make sure to stick your stomach out a little more. Mess up your hair a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah Throw no, some dirt on Totally. There. Yeah. Next question is from Phoebes Cray K. Can you spot reduce or do you lose fat all over even if you target a certain part of the body? So we've covered this on previous podcasts mm-hmm. uh, a while ago, and I, f- I forget how many episodes we've done um, since then. And so I think it's an important thing that we cover again. Yeah, I think we visited because this, this is use sweat cream. Yeah, <laughs> you could definitely do it. This is super. It's still one of the most commonly believed things among people who work out. So when we picked this question, I quickly went online just to look at the the m- modern evidence because I've known for a long time that spot reduction is largely a myth. Uh, the, the belief is if I work out you know, my right leg and I leave my left leg alone, not only will I build more muscle in my right leg, but then I will also burn more body fat locally in my right leg than I will in my left leg. And that's been pretty much debunked. They've done many, many, many studies on this, and they've shown that it is not a local fat burning effect. There's more of a systemic effect where your body mobilizes body fat systemically and it usually burns body fat from the places uh, that you tend to store it. Um, like the first place you burn it is the last place. Your heaviest that you, reserves. As you store it. Yeah. And yeah. not only that, but the, the first place you store it is the last place you lose it. Right. So if you tend to store in your belly, that's typically the last place you're going to lose it as you get leaner. You lose it from everywhere else <clears throat> before that happens. Now, as I'm looking through these studies, I did find one Believe it or not, I did find one that hints that some spot reduction I've read that. may I've, actually occur. I've read that. I've read that, but the the amount is so small. It's negligible. Exactly. That it doesn't matter. It's like it's not it's and not that, worth it's definitely not worth doing a thousand crunches a day if you're trying to fucking get a flat tummy. Like that would be counterproductive. Doing a thousand crunches, you would be far better off spending that time doing sp- some other shit. Doing cardio, lifting almost anything else. Yeah, I mean, yeah. almost anything else physically. If you were, if your goal was to, you know, get a six pack or have better a- abdominal areas for that, and you have a big belly, you're, you are f- way better off, you know, going on a treadmill or going yeah. for a hike or doing squats or anything else. Being more active and eating right. right. I mean, yeah. a thousand sit ups is better than nothing, right? A thousand sit ups is going to help the reduction in your stomach than doing zero sitting on the Just couch. Just because you're burning calories. Yeah, but the amount of time that it takes you to do a thousand sit ups, if you applied that same time doing almost any other exercise, because almost every other exercise probably burns more calories than a crunch does. You would be you would get further along your your goal. Well, you also have this other side too, where if I work out my legs and I build muscle in my legs, um, it's going to create the because here's the bottom line. The bottom line is you want to get leaner, yes, but you also want to look leaner. Can you create the illusion of spot reduction through targeted exercise? Yes, you can. Mm. I've experienced that personally. Uh, I'll use my core as an example. You know, for years. I trained my core, my abs and my obliques in particular, with high repetition type exercises. I f- believe the myth that you train the abs and the core differently than you train the other body, that you need to train it with high reps. 
that that's how you develop those muscles and that low reps or high resistance doesn't do much for the midsection. And so for years, that's how I trained my core. And when I'd get really, really lean, I would get a six pack, but I'd have to like flex my abs to really see it. And I never had that six pack that was there when I was relaxed. Like I was always jealous when I would see athletes that were just kind of sitting there breathing and not even flexing their abs, but they had this like really Mm well-defined midsection. In particular, I remember watching uh, the movie Predator and you had uh, Carl Weathers in Predator. (laughs) And Carl Weathers has his shirt off a couple times and he's breathing heavily and he's just got these abs that protrude. And I remember thinking like, fuck, do I need to get leaner to get that? Like how lean do I have to get to be able to get abs where I could see them without having to flex? And the leanest I'd ever gotten up until this point would be around 7%, which is fucking lean. That's single digit body fat and not stage lean, but it's, it's quite lean. Now, fast forward a few years later, and I started to understand that some of the myths I had surrounding, uh, you know, some of the ideas I had around uh, surrounding core exercises were myths. So I started training my abs and my core with more resistance, you know, decline sit-ups, you know, hanging leg raises, but done with, you know, perfect form, you know, flag, uh, flagpole exercises and stuff like that, uh, you know, uh, planking, but doing them with lots of tension and resistance. And my abs started to develop. I started to build the muscles of my abs. Now, as a result of that, my abs and my midsection looked leaner even at the same body fat percentage or even higher body fat percentages to the point where now at 9% or 10%, whereas before at 10%, you couldn't see my six pack unless I really flexed and had good lighting. Now you could see my six pack standing there relaxed. And it wasn't because I reduced more body fat around my midsection. It was because I created the illusion of looking leaner because my muscles were more developed. And this is why I think so many people but are bought into the spot reduction myth because they realize they see that. Oh my you God, I you, work don't out think my was, you don't think it's from all the cordyceps and chaga that you were rubbing on your abs yeah, to get, no. get, get that to reduce? No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's, you know, what's funny. You just brought up chaga. So, uh, uh trip, cause I know they're, we're, so we're sponsored by four Sigmatic and they have one of their supplements is chaga. I just read an article on chaga on how people in Siberia in Russia have been using chaga because it grows naturally on trees hmm how they've been using it for a long time, you know, hundreds of years, it has been something that they've consumed to help them deal with the hunger pains of long fasting. Because when these people in Siberia would go hunting or whatever, it could be a week Oh shit, before, I was just making that shit up. No, it's for reals. They, it would be like a week before they would find, you know, or kill something. So they'd go without food for a whole week. And chaga in Siberia and Russia was used differently than it was used it was used in Chinese medicine for them they were used it to help combat the fatigue and effects of hunger so i did a little research and it's i did a natural fun- appetite re- or suppressant huh yes oh, wow. it actually is it's actually hmm. a natural appetite suppressant so uh, which uh, you know on the topic of fat loss um, for some people that can help uh, is you know putting yourself in a state where you're not necessarily craving but I also want to I also want to make the point too but this is also how these companies get away with marketing fat loss pills and things like that is they throw something like chaga in it and now make this claim that it's a fat loss pill because it can actually help suppress your appetite it's interesting it's, it's also anti uh, fungal anti-parasitic antibacterial so sometimes uh, cravings are the result of uh, like if you have, um, God, what is it called? It's a fungus like a that. Or... No, it's a uh, it's a fung it's a it's a fungus that you can get a lot of, and you can go on a diet that's anti. And I can't think of the name right now. Doug's gonna look it up for me. Um, but anyhow, uh, if you have overgrowths or dysbiosis, uh, candida. There you go. Candida. Yeah. Candida. If you have like overgrowth of candida, it can it'll cause you to crave. Isn't that what sugar. Chris, isn't that what Christina had? Yeah, mm. she had candida, mm. uh, or a candida overgrowth because everybody has a little candida. Um, because it feasts on sugar, if you have a lot of it, it will compel you to eat more sugar to keep itself alive. Mm-hmm. And chaga is anti-candida. So that may be one of the ways, and I'm speculating here, maybe one of the ways that it kills appetite. But no, as far as uh, uh, spot reduction is concerned, bodybuilders for years have observed that, hey, if I work out my shoulders, they look leaner. I don't think it's because the shoulders are getting leaner. Again, the studies show that that's not what's happening. But your shoulders are going to look leaner right? because you got more muscle. Right. So from that standpoint, spot reduction is real. 
You're not actually reducing more body fat from the area you're working, but if you develop the muscles underneath you're it, developing and defining, right. you're going to look leaner in there. If you right. get more muscular legs, even even if it's the same fat, but we're on your talking legs. about somebody with a lot of fat. I think know? I think this is where the misconception comes from because sure. if I had a, if I had a, like a female client, this is common that they come in and they say, you know, Adam, I want to my flabby arms. I want to get rid of the, my flabby arms or whatever. You know, it's it's not just us leaning out. I mean, that's part of the process, but it's also building some biceps and triceps because that's going to tighten up. I know that if I reduce her body fat and I build her arms, it's gonna it's gonna give her that illusion of her skin tightening up because she's gonna lose fat and then she's all gonna replace that fat that's there now with muscle that she's built and it's actually gonna fill out her arms, give her more shape to her arms because that's another thing too, like the way fat looks in us versus what muscle looks like it, the shape of it is even different you know dude 15 percent yeah. body fat on a man that has no muscle looks very different than 15 percent body fat on a muscular guy oh very and i'm good. talking about by the way 15 percent means that they have the same amount percentage of their body's body fat so it's equivalent so i know some people are gonna be like well he actually has more body no uh 15 of their body weight being body fat in both cases the guy with more muscle, if you took his clothes off, looks leaner. Same is true for women. If you have the same body fat percentage, but you have muscular development, you are going to look leaner. So from that standpoint, spot reduction well, is a real thing. Also, with body fat being considered like, uh, you know, when you when you consider bloat too, like how, what that looks like, you know, when you're really bloated like all the time. Like oh, dude, that's huge. Yeah. That's huge. It's, and that's just, factor. that's just your digestion. Yeah. Like, it's just something simple. Like oh, that. man. I had this client that I trained a long time ago who was, uh, she was lean, like fit and lean. So her body fat percentage, if I had to guess, was probably in the mid teens, which for a woman is pretty lean, like 15, 16% you're pretty lean. But she also had digestive issues. And I remember uh, she hired me, we started training together and she would tell me like, man, by the end of the day, Sal, she's like, my stomach would be so bloated that I'd feel like I almost look pregnant. And she sent a picture to me once and no joke, like you're talking about, I mean, a massive difference between how she looked in the morning and how she looked at the end of the day. Then she ended up working with uh, one of the individuals I had in there that worked with nutrition and, and helped find her food intolerances. She figured those out. She didn't get any leaner, but for sure she looked leaner. You know, that's what I'm the saying? thing. Like the, the perception. Like I've noticed that too. Even like I don't want to throw my wife under the bus, but you know, there's times where I know she's been like eating a certain way, and it's really like she's retaining a lot of water and always complain. I'm like, dude, you're just bloated. Oh, yeah. I, I notice a huge difference, dude. I, yeah. Like that's why I tell you guys all the time about the the diet soda thing, so that when they're in, I can see my body, my face is holding water, my stomach looks bloated. Mm-hmm. Cut them out, and all of a sudden, I look I look way different. Right. Like, and it does. It t- it takes like a day or two, you know, a day or two, and then it kind of releases everything, and then you can see a huge difference. And the minute I drink it again, it's now. Here's another tough. interesting thing about fat loss is. Uh, just because we're saying spot reduction is a myth and it's proven by many, many studies doesn't mean that the things that you do or that your body changes within your body won't change how the sequence or the pattern that you burn body fat. That actually would change with your hormones. So so studies have shown that if your cortisol levels are high, if you're a woman and you're estrogen dominant or if your progesterone is off or... If you're a man and you have oh, low, if you have low I'm, testosterone, I'm dealing with this right now. I told you, remember yesterday day I was sharing with you, you know the the biggest part and you know the the depression. Like I'm not a guy who gets depressed, right? I have a very positive outlook on life, and I typically can take anything that's bad in my life and spin it for the good or find the good the the silver lining, right? But this uh, this whole low testosterone thing, it's there's so many other factors, and one of the ones that I wasn't prepared for mentally was to see how it's actually changing the shape of my body. Like I, I have this kind of pear shape. You're look. storing body fat differently. Yeah, yes, the way I'm storing body fat is different than how I would normally store body fat. Hmm. I can, I can, vi- I can visibly see the difference on how my body's holding, and it's giving me this kind of, you know, as I'm putting body fat on, it's getting this kind hmm. of pear shape look to me that I've never, I've never really had, and it's really, it's fascinating and depressing at the same time. I'm fascinated by it because I know what's going on with my body. I know that I have very low testosterone right now, and I'm working on that. 
but to to try and stay the course and do what I need to do to try and build it back up while seeing things like that. It's a motherfucker. There's multiple factors at the end of the day. You right. know, it's like, so you can't just, like, that's why spot reduction is not, you can't just like definitively say like, yeah. Like, what do you, what do you think that is? So do you think it's like the, my, because my estrogen is higher and my, my testosterone is so low. And so uh, what, I think it's the ratio of estrogen to testosterone, just low testosterone. They'll, sh they'll show that if a man, has low testosterone, uh, his his fat storage will change. Same thing for a woman. Uh, you'll notice how younger women tend to store more on their hips and thighs and butt, and as they get older, they start to store more belly fat. Um, that's a ch that's hormonal changes, and they show in studies that when they give hormones to people, that their fat storage patterns start to change as well. So, do you, do you think it's so obvious that like if we were to, you know, put ten men in a room? And the the body types were very very different. Like say they're all about twenty five or thirty percent body fat, so everyone's carrying yeah. significant weight on them. Do you think that we could guesstimate like that person probably has lower testosterone than that person? This person has. I think it's it's a factor, but I think it's one factor. Yeah. There's a lot of factors that'll determine that, mm -hmm. um, and I don't think we've isolated every single one of them. But genetics plays a role. So do hormones. Like if we. Like, I, I think, again, we talked about this in the, earlier in the episode, there's this genetic kind of propensity to where you're going to tend to store body fat mm -hmm. and where your hormones are will dictate where you fall on that spectrum. But you may have a spectrum that's kind of set for you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, I've known guys that, I've known guys that were on anabolics that store. I had a buddy that used to take anabolic steroids, you know, all the time. And this dude just stored body fat in his fucking upper chest, back, and neck. He just, and it was strange. And you've, I'm huh. sure you've seen people like that where they just store really weird yeah. in their upper body and they get a lot of fat around their chest. And that's just the genetically how he stores body well, fat. Well, and every, I know every woman's seen the girl who's fucking blessed and lucky who puts- she Stores every, in her boobs and ass. Boobs and ass. That's really, yeah. she, she puts oh, on 15 oh, pounds of fat. It goes all to her tits and ass. It's yeah. like fucking, <laughs> oh, bummer. Yeah. <laughs> I can't eat that cheesecake. <laughs> it's going to good Everybody, places. <laughs> every girl hates that girl, right? Yeah. Everybody yeah. hates that girl. All right. Next one is from Skamy Nesky. What do you guys have against standing on a Swiss ball while performing lifts? As long as the weight is light, I have found it pivotal in developing my stabilizer muscles and improving overall core strength and balance. Did you, who picked this? Yeah, did I pick, did. I did. Yeah. <laughs> did you want to jab our boy or well, what? Is that why? Here's the thing. Did you want to jab him? I don't know what boy we're talking about. Dude, we're that's talking. don't you know that's like the biggest knock that everybody has on functional patterns. Is it all oh, standing on balls and stuff yeah, like that? Yeah, yeah. You always see him defending himself about it because I, other other He's fit, got good fit, shit. Right. He's got really really good shit. Um, you know, here's the thing like so nothing. We have nothing against it. Now, here's the thing. When you're spending your time working out, uh, first off, you have goals that you want to consider. What are my goals? And then you also want to look, on, look at what kind of a return are you going to get for the time that you're investing in, these, uh, in exercises. Now, if you're the average person and your goals are to be more fit more muscle, less body fat, and just, you know, just overall move better. And you have a grand total of four hours a week uh, to dedicate to the gym, which is a decent amount of time. It's more than most people. Most people can only dedicate two or three hours a, gym, a week. Do I think you're going to get a lot of return on investment on spending tons of time? No. Trying to balance on a physio ball, stand no. on it, doing curls. Stuff like, no. Mm. I think you'll get way more uh, just perfecting a barbell squat, barbell deadlift, overhead press, some rotational stuff. and Like gross motor movement. Yeah, you're just going to get way more return. If you're a football player and you want to maximize your power and speed and you only have seven hours a week to spend in the gym, I also think it's not that good of a return on investment because you need power, strength, um, and agility. And although I can see a place for some of this, I don't see a ton of, of return on investment. If your goal is to be able to balance on a physio ball, or your goal is to then have... Then it's a great idea. Then it's a great idea. Yeah. The body is very specific in how it adapts, uh, and it adapts to what you do. And there's some carryover to other things, but there's not a ton. There's not a ton of carryover. So if you get someone who gets really, really good at squatting on a physio ball, they're probably going to add some weight to the squat, but not a lot. If you get someone who just squats, they're going to add a shit ton of weight to their squat. Now, which one is going to contribute more towards what your goal is? That's what you have to ask yourself. That's all it is. That's the only reason why 
in the past that may sound like we have a problem. Now, when it comes to developing stabilizer muscles, I really hate that term because what do you mean by that? Yeah. Like I can develop, I can develop a stabilizer muscles really well with every isolation time you movements. do anything, you're yeah. developing stabilizer muscles. Yeah, like so what do you mean by that? That's it's a very generic term that people throw around that doesn't really mean fucking jack shit. No, I, you know, I don't know. Here's, I'll tell you something that I used to do. It wasn't on a stability ball. I d- I used to flip over a Bosu ball, and I would have clients do squats on there, and the and the logic behind why I would do this is it was a really cool way to teach people the mechanics of the squat. Because if you stand on a, if you flip a BOSU ball over where it's kind of wobbling. How much pressure are you putting on like each side? Everything, yeah. right. You can't, you have to really distribute your weight evenly to get down. And I, this would just be body weight. They're not stack. I'm not stacking weights on them. So you're really using it more as a teaching tool. Right. I help them up yeah. onto it and then I, and then I have them squat down. And what I'm trying to show them is this is how your body needs to look mechanically mm-hmm. when we're on stable ground. And so I used it as a tool like that mm-hmm. to refer to for them. It was not like a staple exercise that was in my routines. It wasn't for every client of mine, but I, you know, some clients don't understand cues. Like some clients, if you say retract your shoulders, they just can't fucking compute that, you know, or if you'd say sit back on your hips, they just can't fucking, they can't compute. They just don't, they don't have that. Right. So I've used a lot of techniques, a lot of stability type techniques to force people in a good posture, standing on one leg and doing bicep curls, doesn't sound like it's a, a very good idea or the best way to spend your time, but there are some benefits from it that I've used because what it does is try standing, having bad posture and swinging dumbbells up and bicep curls on on one leg. You'll right. probably fall over to the side. So it does create a, uh, it, I have used it as a tool to teach people proper mechanics that can't you know, articulate their, their, their body the way I want them to. I like that. And uh, I, 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 I tend to like, so I, I did the same thing where I, I used NASM and I tried to kind of go completely in that direction when I first was getting started as a trainer where I'm doing like the single leg bicep curls. I'm doing, you know, uh, the balancing, um, you know, reactive type training like heavily in the beginning. And, you know, I understand the concept with that, but then you start to realize what actually applies to real world functionality and in, in everyday activities that uh, you know I'm going to be placing my body in certain positions. So those are the ones that I tend to gravitate more towards, and that was usually in a split stance uh, where I have two touch points because if I am in a single leg position, it's not for very long. And so like for me, it made a lot more sense to focus a little bit more on step ups if that's my goal. Uh, and then load it and then also rotate my body in certain directions where I knew real life, like I'm going to experience some of these things if that's what I'm training for. It's similar to me like uh, Olympic lifting, and I'll explain what I mean. Olympic lifting is a very high skill um, form of exercise. When you get good at the skill, you can reap a lot of the benefits but a lot of what you'll be getting with Olympic lifting for the first, I don't know, year, and this is for somebody who's got good movement and can have, and good mobility, a lot of the, the first year is not reaping the benefits of Olympic lifting. It's just learning the skill of it. Mm-hmm. When you put people, most people, on stability balls and you know balance boards and all these different things, a lot of what they're getting for the beginning for a long time is just learning the skill of being able to balance on this particular you know, to device. It's not getting the benefit of necessarily the strength, the force generation, the muscle, the metabolic changes, and that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So when you're a trainer and you have a client, you're training three days a week, and this is the average client, and the average client is relatively deconditioned. Maybe they worked out in the past, but right now they're not working out. No major injuries or anything like that, but just your average, you know, 35 to 40 something year old, you know, client. And I have three hours a day to spend, on, excuse me, a week to spend on this person. How much time do I want to spend developing a skill that we may reap some benefit from later on Mm -hmm. versus let's get you to do these fundamental movements like a squat, like an overhead press, like a row, where there's going to be some time developing the skill, but that's going to be much shorter, and then we'll be reaping a lot of the other benefits from it. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So there's just there's a lot of skill involved with some of that stuff. And here's the other thing, too. I said this, the, 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 the law of specificity. Yeah. You could take a, you know, a cyclist with tremendous endurance in cycling and then have them run. They'll still have a lot of endurance, 
but you, they'll notice that their performance is way is way lower. A lot of a lot their ability, too. a lot of their ability is very specific. It's like a pie. To cycling. Yeah, it's like a pie. It's like a wedge of like four quadrants, right? And you got balance, you got power, you got strength, and uh, what was the other one I was thinking? But uh, endurance, and so you're right in the middle, and you're devoting a lot of your attention into one of those pies and you know there maybe there'll be you know like some emphasis where you're including others but like your body wants to be specific into one of those directions for the most part right and and you're going to get better and better in that direction and so you just have to like you just have to be specific you have to know exactly like uh, this is what I'm training right now as a skill and now if I want to develop a new skill and move on and benefit the entire pie I'm going to have to move on yeah. Yeah, that's not, we're not, again, there's, I'm not to say that there's no benefit from using though. I'm not saying it's a waste of time. No. But it, when people place that. It's just not as, on the top of the list. No, and place that as the ultimate importance. Um, and that's a lot of what they do. I'll tell you what, if you're a trainer listening right now and you get the average client that comes to see you and they want to lose 20 pounds and become, you know, more mobile and strong and all that stuff. And all you do are balance exercises. It's going to take a long time for you to show them really show them some return yeah. uh, on their investment. All I did with those those exact clients, I never have ever had a client stand on a stability ball, ever in my entire career. I don't know if you guys have. Stand? I've, yeah. yeah no. Never had a client stand on a stability ball. Uh, what I used to do, though, that was very common, is almost every isolation, standing isolation exercise is in a split stance. And you just change the stance, right? I, and I and I always put the weaker foot forward. So if someone naturally can balance on their right leg a lot better, I put their the the less dominant foot forward and the back foot on its toe. Just throws off their stability a tiny bit, forces them into good posture. I'm doing an isolation exercise like a bicep curl, anyways. I'm not getting huge bang for my buck as far as building my arms. I may as well work on some posture and stability at the same time because I'm doing these little isolation moves. But then the most of the time is focused on the big gross motor movements like squatting, deadlifting, good mornings, things overhead presses, things like that. But when I do isolation stuff, I would incorporate that those type of kind of stability moves in there while I'm also doing something that's an isolation curl mm -hmm. or something. So I think you can, and then when you compare that to somebody who's over here spending a whole hour trying to get up on the ball and balance and stuff like that, I don't know how much more benefit that person is getting than compared to the the client that I have that I'm just incorporating some stability stuff within their isolation. Yeah, and it's move. just what's the what. What, what what are you looking to get out of it? Like I want also to, risk risk versus reward. That's it, it. You have to take into consideration. That's it. And what am I looking to get out of it? I want to uh, look. You know, here's my day. My day is I go to my office. I work at my desk. I play with my kids, and I want to look good. I want to feel good. Um, you know, what am I going to get out of mastering standing on a stability ball mm -hmm. versus you know mastering some basic fundamental movements? Um, you know, that's that's kind well, of yeah. It's interesting too because balance has been like one of those things I've almost abandoned as far as like training, like my emphasis was more on movement patterns and, and being able to recognize deficiencies in, in the movement and really like honing in on that and like, like figuring out mobility drills and different types of flow patterns and things that I can include in order to get the body more responsive and to reconnect that mm -hmm. connection. And, and that, that in itself promoted more balance. Yeah, And here's the thing I would, I would love, I would do this, all day long, I would comp I would set a, up a study or compete with somebody. You give us a bunch of old people who have poor balance, and you could have someone over here just teaching them balance, and you have me over here focusing on strength. Mm -hmm. And I'll bet you, I'll bet you money that my approach will yield faster and better results because at the core of yeah, balance, yeah, strength carries is yes. strength. Yeah. And when you look at the older population. Because uh, of beside okay, children and old people are the people who are most likely to fall and hurt themselves because of loss of balance. Little kids and old people, and the reason why old people fall and hurt themselves, for the most part, because there's a lot of issues that can happen. You can have issues with the inner ear and all that stuff. But let's say they're healthy. Otherwise, is just they're not strong. Right. They're not strong enough yeah. to support they themselves. They miss a step coming down the stairs or something like that. Their coordination is off. Then a lot of that could have been helped. They don't first. have the strength to bend over and pick something up. They don't have the strength to squat down without falling. And when you give them the strength, boom, all of a sudden, they've got the better balance. The abilities are there. Yeah, yeah, versus, oh, here, you know, stand on one foot. Let's time you. Now practice standing on the other foot. Now let's time you. Here, stand on this thing that's, you know, now let me time you. No, no, make them stronger. Make them stronger. You get way faster results. Mm-hmm. Next up is from Mikey V Fitness. 
What's the most dangerous thing? Hey, yo, Mikey V. <laughs> what? Sorry. <laughs> What's the most dangerous thing you guys have ever done? Oh, oh man. Are we going to do like, like right away what comes to mind, I think the some of the most dangerous times of my life was just being involved in the cannabis industry, but that wasn't like. You can't really go into detail, can no. you? No. <laughs> yeah, I can't go into too much detail with that, but it, and it also isn't like this this one event that I did that was super dangerous, right? Like I, right. you know, like a death defying feat, right? Is what right. I'm thinking. Are, are we thinking of physical danger, or are we yeah. thinking of just like overall like da- dangerous? I don't know. Whatever. Like being held up. Yeah. I don't, yeah. I don't know. Whatever. Yeah. Whatever you want. Because that. I mean, during the the time that I was starting up a cannabis club, uh, it had to been. In, in my opinion, the most dangerous time I'd ever been because the laws just weren't uh, all the way in place. I was I was operating in a very gray area. Uh, I was also operating in a field that I wasn't that familiar with. I was relatively new to uh, medical marijuana, and so um, I didn't know what what would come down on me or what they could do to me. And I had seen people around me that. Um, had gone to jail for for stupid little things and and being the guy that was kind of the face and and running the clubs and carrying the product. You're a target. Oh yeah, right. So it it definitely. I mean, I'm sure a lot of my hair thinning and shit happened during that time. (laughs) I'm pretty sure I had a full fucking, you know, luxurious fucking head of hair before uh, before the cannabis industry. Yeah, if I went through that, I'd be like white. Yeah. So definitely, definitely, those were some of the. Maybe that was those are the scariest times for me. Maybe it's not the most dangerous. Like I'm trying to think of like something. I oh, I got something for you that I did. This was probably the most stupidest thing and dangerous thing that we did. There used to be this strip from Oakdale to Turlock. So anybody that lives out there, shout out to 209. And they might know it's this. It's happening out there. There is a, there's the Oakdale, the there's the Oakdale Waterford Highway, which is just a two lane uh, highway that goes between Oakdale, Waterford and Turlock. And uh, we had friends, my cousin went to Turlock High, I went to Oakdale High. So we used to travel this road a lot. And, and we used to, you know, party in Turlock some weekends. We used to party in Oakdale some weekends. I had my license at this time. So this is between the ages of 16 and 18. And uh, over in the valley, those that live over there know that certain times of the year, we get the most ridiculous fog, like nothing that the Bay Area has ever seen. Like, I don't know how familiar you guys are with this or not, but this fog is so thick, you can't see the end of your fucking hood of your car, like that thick, where... It's crazy. A lot of people just won't drive in it or scared of it. If you grew up in it like I did, you're kind of used to it, you know? And so, and, and it's funny because I haven't driven it in a long time and I was back there not that long ago and was in it and I, and I was scared to death. I was like, oh shit, this is crazy how scary this is for me as a kid. The things that I was doing, that's what reminded me of this story. And we were, we were caravanning uh, four different cars. We're heading out to a party in Turlock and it's one of those nights where the fog is literally uh, to the you know end of the hood. You can't see the car in front of you other than the lights. I can see the glowing lights a little bit, but that's it. And the four of us, it's all my high school buddies, are fucking racing. Mm-hmm. In the, in the in the fog God, to this dude, party that's it. and it's it's about a twenty minute trip to thirty minute trip on this highway and we're taking turns wow 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 passing each other on a two lane highway in the fog like this crazy I'm such an old man now I want to like yell at you oh dude you know I, I, mean? I think I want to yell at myself I think yeah. what the fuck were you yeah. thinking you could have yeah. died that night bro what were you doing the teenagers like, are such fucking idiots oh man it was so God, stupid just reminded me of stuff. Uh, oh man I did you know I think back to that it, what reminded me I just recently I went back to the valley I see my, my family and it was foggy and it wasn't nowhere near as foggy as that night because I still remember that night vividly and I thought to myself, like, how scared I am right now just to drive normal. You know, I'm fucking 10 and 2. I'm driving 20 miles an hour. It's because when you're young, you have zero concept of, like, you think, like, hey, nothing's going to happen. You have zero. And yeah. testosterone's flying. Yes, right. That's which mm-hmm. we all know testosterone is not the best decision-making hormone <laughs> by far. No. When no. your testosterone's high, there's a lot of stupid shit you tend to want to do. Yeah. And you're, it's I mean. It's kind of like you turn into a werewolf. Yeah, I mean. Dude, you get in fights, you you sleep, you have you know risky sex, and you drive your car like an idiot, and, and it's you just wake up and your clothes are gone. You're, yeah, and you're yeah. just a, just some more. So I remember. So when I so I drove horribly when I was a kid, uh, horribly, very very dangerous. I did a lot of dangerous stuff, but one story in particular pops out. So I used to have a the first car I ever bought with my own money was a Toyota four cylinder pickup truck base model and of course you know i tried to fix it up so i put like an exhaust on it and you put some exhaust. stickers and yeah. the spoiler on it yeah it was a, it was a, four, it was a little four banger <laughs> so i had this truck uh, i'm probably 
Like, I think I'm 16 years old, maybe 16 or 17. So maybe 16 or 17 years old, right around my stupid and, age. Yeah, and I used to, <laughs> I used to race everybody. Like, I don't care who you are. If you took off slightly fast at the at the stoplight, right. we're gonna race. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's just what I did everywhere. I don't care if I'm going down the street. I'm gonna race somebody. Mm-hmm. So I pull up next to this big uh, truck. It was like a big Chevy, and the light. And he's next to me. And he revs a little bit. Now, I don't know if he was trying to race or if I'm just like trigger happy. So I hear him rev a little bit. Light turns green and I burn out and I take off. And I don't even think he was racing me. I take off and then I go in front of him and I tap my brakes a little bit because that's what do you? That's what we used to do. You race, you beat someone, you go in front of him, you tap your brakes, let him know, hey, I beat you. So this fucking dude guns it. And starts to come around me. So I'm like, oh, now he really wants to race. So then I gun it. Mm-hmm. And so we're both going down Santa Teresa hella fast. Well, he pulls up next to me because he had a bigger truck. He pulls up next to me and I'm laughing my ass off and I'm flipping him off like, yeah, let's fucking race. I'm thinking I'm having a great time. I look over and I'm not exaggerating. It's the biggest motherfucker I've ever seen in my entire life. Ever. <laughs> Never have I seen a huge... Never have I, and I remember I was into lifting weights. I had never seen a human this big in my life. He sticks his arm out of his window and he's got his fist and he's yelling at me. All I noticed was his arm and it was massive. He had this massive, veiny, crazy looking muscular arm and I'm looking over at him and he's fucking yelling and spit is coming out of his mouth because he's so pissed off. So I'm looking at him and I'm like, oh shit, what the, this guy's fucking huge. So I'm like, I'm not going to stop or slow down. I'm going to keep fucking going. So now I'm still taking off. He's still coming after me. He's swerving into me, trying to fuck with me. And I'm yelling through my window like, hey, man, fucking chill out. That's what I keep telling him. Chill out, man. Chill out. I'm you know, Chill out. So I'm we're driving, and then the light in front of me is red, and there's cars stopped oh, at the stoplight. Oh, God. So now I'm like, and my only way to get out would have been to go right, but he's on my right, uh, and so I have nowhere to go. So I'm like, oh fuck. So I had, luckily I had the, uh, you know, the vision of not pulling directly up to the car in front of me to give myself some space. So I pull, I stop and I give myself about, I don't know, three car lengths uh, in front of me. He stops uh, right next to me, gets out of his car. So now I'm like, oh shit. So I'm telling him, Hey man, don't fucking like I like just chill. He grabs my rear view that my my side window or whatever and he tries to rip it off and it kind of breaks off to the side. Oh really? Yeah. So I back my car up and he's in front of my car and I tell him like I'll run you over dude if you come out. Now I'm literally think cuz he's a man, he, as he gets out, he's a big dude. He's like 6 foot something. Probably and I'm not exaggerating high 200s. So this guy's fucking massive. And I'm revving my engine. I'm like, hey, man, I don't want no trouble. I don't want no trouble. And he's yelling at me. People are starting to honk their horns and stuff like that. He gets in his car and I go home. That was a dangerous situation. I totally forgot all about that. You just you just reminded me. There's too many car related stuff. Right. Yeah. So yeah. You, know what, you know what's funny? I have a bunch of car stories. You know what's stories. funny? Is I remember what he looked like. And if I ever encounter that motherfucker, <sighs> we're going to have a nice conversation. You could have, a, pretty, race. You could have a race again? No, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure yeah. he's not that big him? anymore. There's no <laughs> way that for the last, there's no way in hell for the last 22 years he's maintained that size with the level of drugs he was taking. I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty <laughs> oh, sure he's yeah. weak and shot now. Did I yeah. ever Did I ever share the uh, the tractor story on this, no. on this show? No. I never shared that with you guys? No. Uh-uh. Oh, fuck, dude. Okay, listen to this. This was probably the most dangerous or scary time, too, for me. So I'm, I'm working the dairy, right? So I'm at this time, I am 15 or 16. I think I have my license by now. You're just milking. You're pumping. That's right. I'm a, I'm a bovine mammary extraction technician. So uh, I'm, I'm at the dairy, and it's, it's, really, it's really early on in the job. Like I've only had this job. I worked there for three years, and I, I think I'm only there. I've only been there for like a month or so. And, he, and my boss comes up to me, and he says, you know, hey, would you like to uh, fertilize the, the pasture and stuff? And I'm like, sure. <laughs> yeah, like, I'll, I'll take a shit. No he's problem. like, have you ever driven a tractor before? And I'm like, no, I've never driven a tractor. He's like, that's all right. I'll, I'll teach you. I'll show you. So we head up to where the tractors are at. And what I'm doing, it's wood ash. That's what you use to fertilize uh, the, uh, all the fields. And so it's a ton of it, right? And you've got one tractor that's the loader that scoops it up. And then he's filling it in the back of this other big tractor that's pulling it all. And then that's the one you take over the grass and then you fertilize with. And 
he's teaching me how to use the loader. And he's like, you know, oh, this does this, this does that. And this is how you get all of He's all, and then after you load this thing up, he's all, when you drive this tractor, he's like, the brakes don't work on this. So you just got to keep it in a low gear. Now, mind you, I'm on the top of this hill. It's on the crown of this hill and it's overseeing a hundred acres. And it's very, very top of it. And all the, all the, you know, all the grass is down below. And you go down this hill and at the bottom of the hill, there's a canal and there's the canal to the left and the canal to the right. And there's this, it's a nice pathway. It's a good, good 10, 15 feet wide. So plenty wide for the trailer or tractor to, to drive through there. And at, at the, this is the beginning of, of the hundred acres. So we have a telephone pole that is cemented about six to eight feet in the ground. That is the, the tie off for all the bob wire. So it's the, the main hub right there. And that's right at the bottom of the hill. So I load up, I learn how to use this tractor. I'm having a good old time. Love this. Load it up. There's about uh, about two tons worth of wood ash that's behind this other tractor. So I get on it, and if you've ever driven a, a tractor and been in granny gear before, granny gear really moves about as fast as like a 90 year old fucking grandma would move. Super it's, slow. Oh, I mean, it's like, I mean, inches, right? Mm-hmm. And so I I get it all going, and he's told me, you know, keep it in a keep lo- it there, keep it in a low gear. He says keep it in a low gear, and so I put it in the lowest gear possible, and I realize okay, at this rate, it's going to take me four hours just to get to the bottom of the hill. It's literally that slow. So I pump it in a little bit higher gear and it's it's a little bit faster. And then I get it to like first or second gear. And now I'm like, I'm not going fast at all. It's very slow, but I'm, I'm at least moving. I'm, I'm like walking speed. Uh-huh. I get over the crown and I start to come down. And I'm like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it into a higher gear. Well, I pull it in a neutral, go into a, a one, oh, no. one more gear up. And the tractor had already caught too much speed for that gear, so you can you know what that sounds like when you're trying to. <laughs> it's like yeah, yeah, it's kicking me out of of the the first gear, and it won't let me get into it because the tractor's already starting to pick speed up. Uh-oh. And as a, a kid who's fucking scared to death, I all I keep doing is keep <laughs> forcing it, trying to instead of going up to a higher gear and just getting the thing to at least stay at the speed it's at right now. I'm trying to force it. And meanwhile, you're in neutral. Yes. Meanwhile, I'm in neutral at the top of this hill heading down and it's gaining speed. Oh, shit. And it's gaining so much speed that I probably spent another few seconds trying to get it in that higher gear, realize I'm fucked. It's not going to gear because this thing is now starting. I've got two ton of wood ash behind me that's fucking pushing this trailer tractor down this hill. And I'm getting so much speed now that the front tires are fucking bouncing. And I'm trying to steer it. I'm trying to steer <laughs> oh it God. with two hands. And I, I crank it as hard as I can. Cause, and then I look down below me and I'm heading for this, you know, 10, 10 to 15 foot wide trail that goes between a canal on both sides and the telephone pole right to the left of it. And I'm steering to the right. And then the, the, the wheels catch and then I have yanked to the right. And then I go to the left and I'm going back and forth on this hill. And it's like one minute I'm going to the canal on this side. Then I'm going to the canal on this side. And meanwhile, I'm just gaining speed all the way down. I go through that telephone pole like it's fucking a toothpick. Doesn't even slow me down. <laughs> Shatters it, go through it, and I go. Poof. Are you just praying? Oh, dude, I'm like I'm scared to death, and I go shooting up, land this thing into the fucking canal everywhere. I don't know how I got unscathed because I was flying, and it was just happened to be the way the canal was shaped, and the ta- and the tractor was, and the little bit of water that was in there. There was about four or five feet of water that was still in the canal. And I hit that wood ash come flying over the top of me. So I'm covered in black soot and I'm scared to death. Here comes the boss running down the hill screaming. Ah! Oh, and I'm just shit. like, my heart is out of my chest at this point. Scared to death. I was totally fine. I didn't get hurt, but fuck, that was probably one of the most dangerous, scariest moments of my life for sure. Damn. Uh, uh, I've had enough time to think, but uh, I don't know if it'll top any of those. It's just like, more stupid shit with a car i had a a jeep cherokee that was like all lifted and um i brought it with me out to chicago for like i don't know if it was my first or second year i think that i was out there and um like during the snow like during the winter there was i mean there was we get a, a ton of snow some years and um this time it was like just really really thick and um, we got bored and of course, you know, me being there with a bunch of my buddies from the football team, everybody's off campus. We thought, you know, let's, let's fucking four by four. Let's, let's have fun with this and let's like, you know, like tool around a little bit. And so I, <laughs> one of my friends thought it'd be a funny idea to basically tie a rope to the back of the Jeep. And then, um, I would, I would pull them like they're like snowboarding. Oh yeah. We did this. So yeah. So we, we would do that. And 
So I'm, I'm, I'm driving, I'm, I'm whipping these guys around and they're flying off these embankments and everything. We're having a good old time and it's fun. And, uh, so I just, I just, we were really getting into it, talking shit to each other, trying to see how far we could, you know, launch some of these guys. There's this embankment that kind of went really high and went over, over it. You could get to the football field. And so I was going to do like another one of these turns and like kind of spin and then try and give them a real, you know, whiplash effect and get them to like fly. And then, uh, somebody had been coming like towards me, like a car was coming, like as this, you know, I was just about to make that move and I saw it like last second. And then I turned and I tried to like correct it. And so like half of it spun towards the car coming towards me. Oh guys, you whip him in front of the car. So he whipped like real close to the car. He flew off to one side and then I was able to correct the, the Jeep, but then I flew off the embankment. So I went up the embankment and jumped like over and landed like on the other side. And we all just like stopped it like in our tracks and we're just like, holy shit, did that just happened like i literally caught like serious air like it's, it's crazy these some of these dangerous moments like uh, that are all coming to my head right now all of them i was unscathed i was lucky yeah we made it out totally fine like i remember thinking after my like, car what the fuck was i thinking dude i so so here's something this has nothing to do with the car so when i was younger i got really into as many people know i got really into working out building muscle and all that stuff and i got really into supplements and the chemistry of supplements and how they affect the body and at this time, I'm probably, again, I'm probably 17 years old, maybe 18 years old. And uh, ephedra is, not only is it fully legal, but it's the top selling like hardcore fat burner you can buy. Now, for people that don't know, ephedra is a methamphetamine. It's a, uh, and they used to sell the herbal form of it, ma huang, which is this Chinese herb that contains- Ma huang. Yeah, exactly. Contains uh, ephedra alkaloids in it. And supplements would typically give you one serving would have 25 milligrams of, a, of ephedra alkaloids. I believe, don't quote me on this, but I believe that was like the max dose that, that they is, would give you. It is. 20, 25 milligrams is, the, is what they say is the max dose you okay, take a day. That you take at one time. Right. Not a day because then, they, then you would end up taking like four servings, right? So those 25 milligrams of ephedra was what they said that you took. <laughs> then you combine that with uh, 100 milligrams of uh, aspirin. And then you combined it with 200 milligrams of caffeine. Oh, yeah, it was the caffeine, yeah, aspirin, this. ephedra stack. And it and what what aspirin did oh is aspirin uh, prolonged the half life of the ephedra, so it just made it last longer. Oh, I thought it had something to do with your blood. Uh, well, I know it thinned your blood and other things, but yep. what, it, what the reason why you took it with the ephedra was it would prolong the the effect so you on have your body. Longer lasting. So yeah. it's longer lasting. So this was like the go-to pre-workout, like I, I'm telling you right now, if you get your hands on, and I don't recommend this, but if you ever tried ephedra, ca caffeine, and aspirin, first off, you need to be have a strong heart to do this. If I did it now, I'd have problems. <laughs> yeah, we're not recommending yeah, this. But, but I mean. as a kid, I'd take this and I'd be on fire. I'd work out super hard and it was great and lots of supplements contained it. Ultimate Orange was one. Dan Tucane sold that. Ripped Force by Twin Lab com contained it, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Now I, being the, you know, super nerd that I am, learned about the effects of these things, and I bought them all individually. I bought ephedra, mm -hmm. I bought aspirin, I bought caffeine. So you made your own concoction, and then I learned about the different receptors that these things activate in the body, and then I learned that oh wow, I can combine these with yohimbi, which is uh, another stimulant-based uh, herb, and yohimbi <laughs> will actually change my body's internal thermostat. So uh, I guess it, the way I thought it worked was ephedra, caffeine, and aspirin raised your core temperature. That was what thermogenic was about it. But then you have this thermostat that limits how high it can go. Yohimbi changes the thermostat. So now you get a higher thermostat. Now in reality, what I was doing is I was just throwing a bunch of stimulants together. So I buy, I got ephedra, aspirin, caffeine. I don't know how much of each I took, but I know it was more than they recommend. And I took a full on like maximum dose of Yohimbi. So now I combine all these three things and I may have even added another stimulant, but I remember those four for sure. So I take all these supplements and I head off to the gym. <laughs> Actually, I know I wasn't 18 yet because I was working out at the YMCA. So I must have been 16. 
So I go to the YMCA combining all these supplements that I had read about and I had formulated in my head like, this is going to be fucking awesome. Go to the gym and I work out like a maniac, like an asshole. Like I'm literally on drugs and I'm hitting everything and I'm hitting everything hard and I'm in there forever and I'm working out for, I don't know how many hours I worked out, but it was a long time that I worked out in the gym to the point like way longer than I should have, right? It's probably like three hours of working out. Get on my bike, I ride home. As I'm riding home, every... I don't know, a couple minutes, I feel my heart skip a beat. Like, <laughs> you know? And, and by the, at this point, I'd never felt that. Like, oh, I, I'd never felt feeling, like, dude. yeah, so I'm like, what the yep. fuck? I'm like, what's going on here? This is weird. So I get home, and my heart is, and I'm like, this is, fuck, I'm whacked out of my mind. So I'm like, I'm like, maybe if I eat something. So I make myself a sandwich, I eat a sandwich, and I'm feeling nauseous now. Do, 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 do. Heart's doing like this thing. And what I don't realize, I'm having an anxiety attack basically, right? Mm-hmm. But I don't know what that was. So I eat more food, still feeling shitty, drink a weight gainer. Oh, fuck. I think I'm going to throw up. I go upstairs in my room and I lay down and I'll never forget this. I lay down in my bed and I'm laying back and I'm like, I need to take a nap. Like I need to go to sleep to make this feel better. There's no way in hell I'm going to fall yeah, asleep. No. So I'm laying there with my eyes open heart beating like crazy and I make a deal with God. Yeah. <laughs> this is, you know, I, I, I'm starting to make a deal with God. I'm laying there and I'm like, um, you know, because at this point... We, Which you, you know it's bad if the atheist guy is doing that, right? Bro. <laughs> <laughs> Which you got to know... Look, man, I haven't been promoting you or anything. <laughs> yeah, but... Oh, I'm hedging my bets. Because <laughs> yeah. you need to know that... Do this one time. Up until favorite. this point, one of the major battles between me and my mom was supplements. She used to tell me like, you're going to kill yourself. These things are dangerous. And of course, I think I know more than she does. So I'm like, you don't know what you're talking about. Don't worry about it. Blah, blah, blah. So I would take these supplements and sometimes I hide them and she didn't even know, right? So I'm laying there. I'm making a, like a deal with God. Like, please don't let me, because my heart now is skipping beats, it's fucking beating fast. I'm sweating. Hands are cold. Now I'm nervous on top of it, which is probably making it worse. And I'm like, please God, don't let my mom find me like this because they're going <laughs> to fucking know that I did this to myself. And I laid there and I was there all night. Like yeah, I didn't sleep at yeah. all. I did the same thing. And it myself. finally wore yeah. off and I never combined those supplements again, man. Why? I mean, why do people, I, people wonder too, why we're so passionate about the whole anti-supplement thing. I think that we have, we I think fucked we, with a lot of right, them. Right, right. I think we all, we all did this as kids trying to get the competitive edge. The on shitty shit. thing dude, is, dude, many things. We took many things before a football game once. I almost died, dude. Like I was on fire that first oh, many quarter. Things, yeah. Woo, man, I was making every tackle and then my mouth was like, oh, Dude, cotton like, mouth, yeah, cotton mouth foaming, and then I was just, oh my god, I had to like pass Dude, out. Dude, I, uh, I remember we used to. I mean, we've talked about these speed stacks that were made by American yeah. Bodybuilding, and speed stacks had the aspirin, caffeine, and ephedra in there. They didn't have the aspirin, but they had the ephedra and well, the caffeine. No, they did. It wasn't called aspirin. It was called white willow bark. Oh, uh, oh. Uh, it was mm. white will- willow bark was in there because if in order to sell aspirin, you have to. Sell. Remember, I bought oh, aspirin. No shit, yeah. I, that I did not know. I yeah. mean, fucking, I drink those. Like my, I, the story you just told is like spot on <laughs> to <laughs> exactly what happened to me when and and I remember this day. I'll never forget it either. The same thing. I didn't sleep that whole next day after that, and that was four speed stacks and six hydroxy cuts. Oh my so God. So I, t- I had drank four speed stacks over the course of the day. It was a closeout with Mark. And I had taken six hydroxy cuts, pills. And each one of those are like doses, dude. That was, it was insane. And I remember laying in bed at three o'clock in the morning and my, my hands trembling and shaking and just couldn't sleep to the point where at about four o'clock, I got up, showered, went back to work at five o'clock and worked the next day. I crashed about one or two o'clock in the afternoon and then fucking slept for 20 hours straight after that. But it was, whew, it was scary. I remember being scared, like literally laying in my bed, like scared to death, like, oh shit, I pushed the limits. Yeah. You I know, never felt that And this before. is the thing now that I'm a parent, when, when I think of the shit, and I was a cautious kid. I was. I was not yeah. like a super, I wasn't a daredevil. I know I wasn't as... Uh, you know, daredevil as you guys was, believe it or not. I know I was, I was very cautious compared to my friends and I still did shit that was fucked up, especially as a teenager. And as a parent, man, it just makes me, it freaks me yeah, out Yeah, I just bit. like smashed my way through a lot of things. So there's <laughs> plenty of those stories, but that's, you know, it's boring. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so check this out. It's January. You can actually get a workout programmed by Mind Pump for free. All you got to do is go to YouTube. Go to the Mind Pump uh, MPTV, Mind Pump TV channel on YouTube. And what we've done is for the month of January is you're going to get a workout 
to do every single day. So this all you is do- perfect for somebody who has either been out of the gym for two or three weeks or more, or somebody who has never started at their fitness journey. A perfect place for you to start uh, your your programming. I mean, this is that's how we program it. Like you go on there day one, you do these exercises. Day do day two mobility day three and then we slowly progress you and ramp you up uh throughout the whole you know 30-day process it's a completely free video uh series that you'll find on youtube it'll be there forever so go check it out tag your your friends get someone to do it along with you and if i think you have to turn on notifications on your youtube channel and then you'll get a notification as soon as the workout pops up right thank you for listening to mind pump If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic, nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.